Well, this is exciting. I think this might be our first bonus episode we've ever done. We've been having a lot of questions recently about exercise and Steph and I, we often respond to them from our own experience, but it's not really our professional niche. Wheelhouse. Yeah, exactly. So we have got Marcus Kane back by popular demand. But I mean, we're going to be continuing this conversation in Brighton on Monday, the 20th of May. So if anybody listening is in traveling distance from Brighton and want to come out, hang out with the three of us and a few of our other listeners, we will pop some details in the links below in the description below the show Either notes one. below wherever yeah. you're listening usually below yeah, that, just look that'll do it. just look down below and you'll find out look down under <laughs> <laughs> well, okay oh, good one <laughs> so we've got some questions marcus from our community for you let's do it steph and i probably won't be able to help but throw in our two pence or two cents as well let's just kick off so first question mm. for you marcus feel silly but how to start Exercise seems in me so closely linked to wanting to lose weight that the path from exercising to wanting to do it to lose weight is very short indeed. So far, motivation for exercise for other reasons is short-lived. Thoughts? Mm. That's a really tough one because often the motivation for exercise is so closely associated with changing our body size and shape for so long that it can be hard to reconnect with the idea of enjoyable movement. And there's a lot of layers that we got to kind of peel away to get back to how would I move? How would I choose to move if weight loss wasn't the goal? In a similar way with food, when it comes to developing unconditional permission with food and getting back in touch with maybe our natural preferences and the things that we would lean towards if dieting wasn't a factor. It's a similar journey with exercise. Sometimes it can help to reflect on, you know, what did I enjoy when I was a kid? What did I do before this was a thing? And to do your best to remove the, the pressure to achieve anything with exercise. Usually insights with this kind of thing come to us when we make space and practice non-judgment as best we can and give ourselves permission to experiment and just try some things to do some stuff that you might not usually equate with structured training or exercise, you know, like fun stuff you might do with a friend. And I always think about when I would go to like a, a playground or something as a kid, how effective we are before the whole diet and, and exercise thing gets tied together, enjoying movement in a way that's still kind of strenuous, for lack of a better word. Like I, I think of just playing with friends as a kid and ending up just covered in sweat and, and whatever. And maybe that's not everyone's jam. Maybe not everyone is so active, but to start experimenting, give yourself permission to experiment. I think that that's the key and to allow it to be a process that takes some time. Don't put pressure on yourself to come up with answers straight away. When we talk about things we used to do as kids and how that might translate, I would love to run around with my friends right now and feel things so many, but like, this is just not something adults do. So what are mm. some of the things that are available as an adult, like two adults, that might be more of this kind of experimental, like not going to the gym class, but something a little more fun or something a little more related to childlike activities. Sure. It's so easy to get caught up on what we get self-conscious about doing as adults. And, you know, that, that's, that level of self-consciousness is not like unwarranted as adults. There's all this, these layers of like judgment and uncomfortable stuff that we got to navigate. But ask yourself, like, what was the kind of things that you enjoyed as a kid? And, and what might share some common ground with those things as an adult. Like obviously as a 36 year old man, I'm not going to run on to playground equipment during peak hour and like jump on the swings next to the kids. Like that would get some <laughs> sideways get glances. Some feedback. Yeah, yeah. I'd get some <laughs> feedback, but you know, things like, did you enjoy climbing as a kid? Like is rock climbing or, or something like that potentially an avenue? And did you enjoy being in the water? Did you enjoy riding your bike as a kid? Did you enjoy dance? A lot of guys that I work with giving themselves permission to get a skateboard. I'd suggest to open your mind as, as best you can. I think we get these messages about exercise as well. Things like, oh, exercising outside is better. Strength stuff is better. Cardio just wears your body out. The it's almost trying to undo some of those exercise messages like we do the diet culture messages around food, I imagine. Yeah, 
getting away from exercise to lose weight and creating a better relationship with exercise shares all the same fundamental philosophies as changing our relationship with food, permission to be curious, to think outside the box. Can I uh, ask a new question? This one comes from Susan and she says, how do you handle it when the long-term outcome of training is what you desire, but the training itself doesn't overly appeal? I play and love team sport, but the wear and tear on my body after playing for 34 years means I need to do regular strength work to help prevent injury and to keep me playing. I definitely want to keep playing as long as possible. But even though the goal means so much to me, it doesn't feel motivating enough to get me to do the training. I don't particularly enjoy the training. That's a great question and something that I connect with on like a very personal level. Uh, I still train in what some people would call a very structured manner. I still do a bunch of strength training. The intention with strength training and how much of it we do matters. I, I wish I could recall her name, but the woman who wrote the book Sick Enough, can we, can we recall her name? I'm not sure, but she's a, a genius and, and absolutely wonderful. I heard her on a podcast with John Barati, the founder of Precision Nutrition, talking about her relationship with training in terms of the fact that she enjoys going skiing with her family. And the skiing part of it is the fun part. I really hope I'm quoting the right person here. If not, I'm so sorry. But I heard someone talking <laughs> about this with John Barati. They were talking about how they enjoy going skiing. And for optimum enjoyment, of that thing that is so close to their heart and brings them so much joy, there is a necessary amount of kind of training and conditioning to allow for that optimal level of enjoyment because no one wants to go skiing and get injured within five minutes of getting out onto the slopes and just to have a bad time. So this is where looking at what is the minimum effective dose of the exercises and style of conditioning and strength training that's required to optimize performance, minimize risk of injury, and then to take as much of an attitude of neutrality to that training as possible. Now, this isn't going to be for everyone. Not everyone's going to dig this. Not everyone's going to want to do this. But there are two broad avenues here for exercise after struggling with disordered eating and negative body image. One of them is to kind of go down the path of get curious and give ourselves permission to think outside the box in terms of what I might enjoy and just make it about pursuing, fulfilling and enjoying like enjoyable movement. Another one is looking at, okay, there's going to be some strength training involved in what I need to do in order to have optimum enjoyment of the thing that's really close to my heart. Let's look at how to make that constructive from a, a perspective of minimum effective dose. Okay. Like in being intentional about it. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like you're like, you have to feel like you're trapped into doing something you hate so much, so constantly. Exactly. Um, yeah. There are so many different ways to kind of go about strength training. If we're able to be a bit flexible with not attaching ourselves obsessively to what might be, quote, optimal. It's really easy to go down the rabbit hole of what is optimal with strength training. And because there's, you know, we have a lot of science around this, there are a lot of conversations around optimal forms of strength training and all this kind of stuff. The bros on YouTube love to argue about it constantly. But at the end of the day, we need to factor in what is repeatable, what is optimal, and, and what's going to be repeatable and what you can stick to as a program that supports you through your journey of doing the sport or the activity that you love. Definitely, that's a conversation that needs to be had with a very self-aware strength and conditioning coach and not like a workout that's pulled from a YouTube video. I can't stress enough the value of actually having a conversation with a qualified person about this. It's also the kind of thing that sounds like it's for people who are quite serious about the thing that they want to do. But I relate to it even as much as I get on the yoga mat every day. And sometimes of an evening, I don't want to. I don't have the, almost the willingness. I just want to go to bed. So the idea of like the minimal dose, sometimes that could be five or 10 minutes. Most times it's more. But even just getting on the mat, stretching out a few deep breaths gives me what I need to be able to sleep. Because for now, for me to get into bed without 
being on the yoga mat at all feels a little bit like going to bed without brushing my teeth. But that minimal dose, I think, can apply in the most sort of everyday 10 minute walk around the block kind of. It sounds very generic, basic, basic bitch advice, but it's. It's true. It, it, it like things get overly complicated with exercise because people need to keep inventing new shit to talk about. <laughs> like, people need to start inventing new things to talk about in order to keep the space exciting. But really, we know what works when it comes to strength training. There's been a lot of effort for, you know, almost a century now put into understanding maximum recoverable volume, minimum effective dose, which exercises work most effectively for this and that. I just want to say that you're using terms I don't even know about. And so if anyone listening is like, oh, I want to talk to Marcus about these things that you two don't know about and never talk about, you can come to Brighton and listen to Marcus and talk personally to him and get this, this information on May 20th. Just, 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 just saying. I and me and that. Steph will be there as well. So we will help <laughs> translate if, you are, if you're struggling with the accent. I mean, right. most people coming are probably going to be British. So I can be the go-between <laughs> for Steph and Marcus if you can't understand what they're saying. Well, please tell me any of the, which terms sound a bit funky right now? They don't I, sound funky. I'm just like, oh, I didn't know that there was research on maximal, minimum value. Optimal. Oh, optimal. Oh, optimal the, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> like, just as an example, there are resources, this thing called Prilipin's chart, which is basically a, a chart of different rep ranges, and it literally lays out the optimal rep ranges and daily volume for different exercises to the point where it's like, this is the optimal volume, this is the amount that you can do and then positively recover from. And then in the same chart, when you know how to read it, it will talk about, okay, and here's minimum effective volume as well. So if you walk into the gym one day and you're like hungover or something, not that I've ever been hungover in a gym, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> you, but you know, <laughs> you, have a, you have a bad night's sleep, you know, there's a fight at home and you're stressed or something like that and you just feel burnt out and kind of a bit wired or whatever, then you'll know, okay, this is the minimum that I can do today and still know that I've done an effective training session. So when we bring a little bit of science into it and understand strength and conditioning science, it removes a lot of the subjectivity and, and that whole thing of like, oh, I don't feel like I did enough today because mm. that's a, that's a bummer. That's going to get you every time. Yeah. I like that. We'll add, we'll put Perlipin's chart information at the in the show notes cool so i've got another question from the community how do you reconcile wanting to improve e.g lift more weights run faster cycle further with being okay with your current fitness especially when i get such a kick out of improving and also wanting to improve gets a bit problematic if you get sick or injured and i relate to this and i think a lot of people find this marcus that when they start exercising if they haven't been much and they start increasing their movement in the beginning the gains seem quite big like you get to improve and improve and then there has to be a plateau at some point otherwise by now you know we'd be bench pressing houses yeah so how do you think about the psychology of that process in a way that's helpful for people progress is not linear and any content out there that gives you the impression that other people are just progressing constantly all the time perpetually it's a lie. It's really helpful to understand that newbie gains are a thing and it's natural for it to get harder and harder to squeeze gains out of the work that you're doing as things progress. I once heard it described by a US national gymnast coach as, you know, you might spend three years training to get to 90% of your genetic potential. So in the first three years, you'll cover, you'll gain that 90% that of your genetic potential. You'll spend the next three years gaining another 7%. For lack of a better way to put it, we need to be really kind to ourselves through this process and understand the human element of training and performance. This is why sports psychologists exist. 
They are hired by big teams with big budgets and the psychological self-care involved in making peace around expectations, understanding how we progress, understanding how progression is not linear, understanding how really truly effective programming happens in waves that will include peak times and then kind of more active recovery times and everything in between. Progress happens in waves. It's natural not to progress in a straight line. And if you do find yourself struggling with that, you're not alone. If that's what you're experiencing, that is almost part of the deal we sign when we choose to make performance part of our goals. It's frustrating. It's annoying at times. It'll get the best of us if we're not really kind to ourselves and recognize that it's part of the process. And the term slow down to speed up comes to mind. Two quick things I want to add. One was I heard Michael Phelps said in an interview the day after he won the four gold medals that he felt suicidal. He woke up the next morning feeling suicidal. Oh. Because, you know, he set this challenge. And then that to me is the real extreme end mm. of what we're talking about. And the thought that popped into my head about this for, for Penny, who asked the question, is maybe we can shift it to novelty, right? So we want to see improvements in this, that, and other. So it's that whole, maybe you're somebody who wants to have that, oh, I've done something I haven't done before. I've been able to do something I haven't done before. And I imagine that to be potentially just trying out loads of different things. Like go, go play some pickleball if you've never played pickleball. And then you can get good at that in a couple of months and then go to the next thing and go to the next thing. Hmm. If you've got that part of you that is uh, crying out to be fed. Mm. I'd say an, another thing that you just reminded me of, this is one of the reasons why it's so important to be engaging in, in training that you enjoy somewhat, because there are going to be weeks, months that we don't see tangible progress sometimes, or we're just in a different part of a training cycle that involves a bit more low key stuff. Another question. But how to navigate exercise in a bigger body. I have moved from not doing anything to swimming once, sometimes twice a week, which I enjoy, and walking when I can, but I would like to feel fitter. I'd like to do other exercise, but contemplating it feels like it triggers off that panic, must do more and lose weight thinking. My brain then signals danger, so I don't do anything and get anxious, so just waste time thinking, in brackets, overthinking about it. And they just added that it's part of bad memories of getting obsessed with the gym in the height of her eating disorder and being banned due to excessive use at the gym. So this is someone who's been really affected by over-exercise, which I think you can probably relate to on a personal level as well, Marcus. Mm. I'm really sorry to hear that that has been, to, the, to this person, I'm really sorry to hear that that's been your experience and that there have been some, you know, negative experiences with exercise and, and the gym because I had a, a conversation with a client just last week about this when we were talking about permission to just engage in whatever style movement he felt good with or that he wanted to do but he realized when he had space to engage in whatever he wanted when he had that unconditional permission to move his body in any way without making it about weight loss or whatever, there was a lot of the, the echoes of a lot of negative experiences and a lot of weight stigma and a lot of feeling less than deserving that came up for him. And that, that's that been part of his journey. And I'd say that I feel like I would be doing the situation and the experience a disservice if I tried to give some really cookie cutter answer to that because sometimes there's some healing that needs to be done surrounding previous experiences with exercise and I've found it helpful to acknowledge that not everyone gets the same privilege of of walking into a gym or walking into an exercise space and just feeling entitled to be there um it's, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit now. I'm sorry, but I just, can you remind me of, of exactly what, what they, exactly what their experience was? They've started exercising again, been doing some swimming, been doing a bit more walking. They want to feel fitter in their body. 
but they're getting a panic response really to contemplating doing more and feeling quite uncomfortable about being in a bigger body now. Mm. And that, that panic response that kind of comes up, that's something that we, we need to handle outside the gym. Of, of course, it, it's, it's the kind of thing that we need to be acknowledging and responding to and, and validating as best we can. I would never recommend someone just kind of grit their teeth and white knuckle it through feelings of panic around exercise. Take it slow. Do your best to respond to the feelings, acknowledge, validate, allow. And the best thing that we can do is to create some positive experiences any way possible. No matter how slowly that involves moving, it's going to serve us so much better in the long run if we can give ourselves permission to show up in a particular place or in a particular way that gives us even the smallest positive experience around exercise. If if these kind of feelings like panic are coming up to show up somewhere and be like, you know, that was safe, that felt good. I had permission to stop at any time I wanted, any time I wanted to. I had permission to leave any time I wanted to. I had permission to exercise intensely. And I had permission to just take it really easy. Really have that to, to make it an open dialogue with the parts of yourself that do hold those negative experiences and kind of work with them as best you can. You know what? This is a very like simple response to that but i have found it so helpful to when there's this fear particularly about like fitnesses for smaller bodies to just just simple exposure to accounts like yours or there's so many different accounts now who are talking about fitness in all bodies and and it's not even a thing like nobody's talking about it like we're getting cut i mean if you go mainstream you'll find that everywhere but if you know where to look and you're exposing yourself all the time to people who are engaging in fitness or fitness and you know, professionals who aren't talking about that, you're, you're creating a completely new association with that. I remember I used to follow Meg Boggs and I still do follow Meg Boggs and she had written a book called Fitness for Everybody. I remember in that, at that time period, I was like, oh, she's talking about fitness in this way that's not about weight loss. <laughs> like yeah. just a simple exposure repetitively to me was, oh yeah, you can talk about this outside of that lens. And it's just, I think sometimes it's like giving yourself more exposure to that so that you can, so that it feels like, yeah, people just do fitness stuff. Like it is not yeah. for that goal. Absolutely. I feel like my answer went really deep really quickly. And that's kind of the, the in some no, ways. No, I think that... both are relevant. Because I mean, if you had gone simple, I would have gone deep. What you just said, like that that exposure, because it's crazy to me now to think that some people out there in terms of fitness professionals find it impossible to separate weight loss from conversations about exercise. I'm like, Mate, all you got to do is not talk about shit like earning your calories or changing your body size. Like, it's not that hard. It frustrates me a lot. It's not hard to talk about exercise from a professional perspective while keeping it constructive without making it about unconstructive shit. But people seem to struggle. That's how they learned it. It's like how it's in their head, too. Mm. You got to find the people who have deconstructed it before you and then follow them. Hello, my name's Marcus. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> I feel like Marcus Going Deep has pretty much covered the other questions, to be honest. Yeah. I think it pretty much does. I think we'll probably wrap it up here. Thanks for coming and joining us, Marcus. And uh, we'll see you in Brighton. See you there. Okay, I need to go to the... Oh. Sarah, did you record that?